It is a great day, a great day to be here. I am so excited to share this message with you uh, for a couple reasons. One, it's Easter Sunday. So I, I know I probably say this every year, but this is my favorite message of the year to preach because this message just preaches itself. I, I just have to, basically, I can just get up here and be like, hey, Jesus is risen. Y'all go home and eat some good food. Amen, right? But, but I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do a little more than that, a little more than that. Uh, but, but man, I just, I love this message. You can't improve on it. It's so good. And then on top of that, Man, I just got back from a week of vacation, so I had a Sunday off last week, so I'm ready. Like, I, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm ready. I'm pumped up, and I'm going to preach a powerful message today, and, and I'm telling you right now, it's good. So, I, like, I don't care if you feel like that or not, it's good, and, uh, and afterwards, I'm going to get off. I'm going to be like, hey, that was a good job, buddy. You did a great job, so I don't, I don't even care how you feel. I'm preaching to myself today. Um, this is it. This is just such an awesome message, and, and here's why. It's not because of Chris Freeman, but it's because it's the message of resurrection, and, and you, you cannot improve on that. Like, I, I can't make Jesus any more alive than he already is. Are you following me? Like, he is alive, he has risen, and so that, there is no message better than that. I was thinking about it this week, how, how a lot of times in, in Hollywood, they will make these movies. Have you ever seen a movie that's, you know, been done by Hollywood that will say, uh, based off of a true story? Anybody ever seen a based off of a true story movie in Hollywood before? You can interact with me here, all right? Listen, I know it's a, it's a safe, safe room here for you to be like, yes, I've seen that, all right. So, um, so based off of a true story, I've seen those movies myself, and a lot of times, those are some of the best movies. Have you ever gotten to the, to the end of the movie and then you go and you do a little research though and you find out like only 7% of the movie was based off of a true story? Like they just changed so much of the story to improve it, make it more entertaining or more engaging. Listen, you, you can't do that with the resurrection story. Like, like the, the very best of Hollywood could not improve on this story. There is no story better than this story and, and the best part about it is it's true. It's a true story that, that I, just get a, I just get to remind you of you cannot improve on this story. And actually, the Apostle Paul says so himself. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that's where we're going to spend our time today. So if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to open them up to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That's where we're going to park today as we walk through uh, the, the, the story of the resurrection. But the Apostle Paul tells us that exact same thing. He, he basically go, goes back and says, listen, I'm just, I'm just going to remind you of the good news of the gospel today. And so that's what I want to do. And so as you're getting there, I want to give you a little bit of insight on the Apostle Paul because I know some of you, 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 you're regulars, you come to church every Sunday. Others of you, maybe this is your first time going to church in a long time. Maybe you came because somebody extended an invite to you and, and may, or maybe you're tuning in online because somebody shared a link with you, whatever it may be. I know there are some people who maybe you don't even know who Paul is. Like maybe you've heard of him. Maybe you heard that word Apostle before. You're not really sure what that even means. And so I just want to give you a little background, a little context on the person that we're going to read about, what he has to say. So the Apostle Paul, before he was Paul, he was also known as Saul. And Saul uh, was, was famous, he was infamous in the Christian community for persecuting Christians. He actually gives us his resume. In a lot of the other New Testament letters that he writes, he kind of gives us his history, his resume of, of who he was before he met Jesus. And before he met Jesus, he, he tells us he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. Like, like he was from the tribe of Benjamin. He, he was on the fast track to, to religious success in the Jewish faith. And he was a very, very faithful, devout Jew, like completely devout to the law, the Old Testament law of God. And, and he was rising in the ranks uh, uh, quicker than anybody else in, in his kind of peer group. He was rising in the ranks on his fast track to becoming a, a leading Pharisee. And then on top of that, he hated Christians. This man absolutely hated hated Christians, could not stand them, didn't want anything to do with them, and he actually wanted to shut down the movement of the Christian faith because he thought it was an affront to God. And so he would go after Christians with everything that he had. He would chase them down. He would have them arrested. He would have them thrown into prison. He actually oversaw the murder of one of the Christians. He affirmed it. He supported it. He stood there while it happened. And then he met Jesus. This, this, this same brother who hated Jesus, hated everything about Jesus, hated everything about the Christian faith, he had a personal encounter. This is wild. On his way to go arrest more Christians, on his way to do that, he has this encounter with Jesus where, where Jesus reveals himself to him directly, speaks to him audibly, and calls him out of that life and into a life of following Jesus as Savior and Lord. And so that's the man that we're going to read his, his account today in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 15, starting at verse 1. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. He says this, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, 
which you received and on which you have taken your stand. So, so let me just pause here for a second. I want to remind you, he says, of the gospel I preached to you, which you have received and on which you have taken your stand, meaning which, which you have based your entire life off of. And so, so here's the challenge to those of us who have spent our whole lives in church. Maybe for many of you, you made a decision to follow Jesus a long time ago. You, you decided you were going to give your life to Christ and you've been on this journey for a long time. Here's the temptation for you on Easter Sunday. The temptation for you to, is, is to think, you know what, like, I know this story. I, I, I know it. I've been there. I made that decision a long time ago. So I can kind of just, just, you know, lean back, relax a little bit, check out. This, is, this message is for somebody else. Correction, the apostle Paul says, this is for you. He, he's talking to Christians here. He says, I want to remind you, those of you who've, who've made that decision to follow Jesus, I just want to remind you of the gospel to which I, I first preached to you. Like, like you, you, you can't move on from the gospel. You can't improve on the gospel. I want to remind you of that gospel. Verse 2, by this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, meaning you've got to preach the gospel to yourself every day. Every single day, you've got to remind yourself of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Verse 3, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried and was ra- that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter. And then the, to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500, other, uh, 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James. Then to all the apostles. And last of all he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. So here's what I love about this passage. Here's what I love about what the apostle Paul says here. He essentially says, hey, I, I want to, he starts with, I want to remind you of the gospel. I, everybody, no matter how long, if this is your first time hearing it or, or, or the thousandth time you've heard it, I want to remind you of the gospel. You can't move on from this. You can't lose sight of this. So I want to remind you of the gospel. And then he breaks it down into to the most simple, beautiful explanation of the gospel. Like, it, it, even for many Christians, sometimes it's hard for us to be able to articulate. Like, like if, if you were going to explain to somebody what is the gospel, I know a lot of times people really struggle with that. Here, here's the simplest version of the gospel that you're going to find in the Bible, right here. Exactly what we just read. And that's what we're going to unpack for today. And what I love about this is the Apostle Paul says, says these words. He says, this is of first importance. Verse 3, for what I passed on to you I, uh, is of first importance, meaning most important. Meaning there are other things that, yes, they have their place, but they're not most important. And again, so this is the challenge for those of us who are Christians, those of us who've been doing this for a while, those of us who have, who have made Jesus Lord and Savior of our life a long time ago. Our temptation, the longer you follow Jesus, your temptation is to move on from the matters of first importance and to, to kind of get down into the weeds of the things that would maybe be second or third or fourth importance. And then the danger is, to elevate those things as if they're of first importance. So much so that sometimes we'll look at somebody who, who maybe they go to a different church or, or they have a little bit of a, a, a different theological belief on some of those second or, or third or fourth level things. And we'll say, well, if you don't believe exactly what I believe, then you're not a Christian. Anybody ever met a, uh, a super Christian before? Anybody ever been around a super Christian before? You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about the people that go to church when they're on vacation. That kind of, you know, anybody? <laughs> Listen, I'm a pastor. Last Sunday, I was on vacation, and I, the only reason why I went to church is because it was available on YouTube. Like, I was just from my couch. I was like, all right, I'm going to tune in to City Church online. And, and you know what I did? I, I listened, and I listened to Pastor Hooley's message until she started calling me out for my workout group. And then I was like, change the channel, baby. This is <laughs> next, next sermon. No, I'm just kidding. It was, it was really good. Great message last week. Still a little bitter about that. But, but you've been around those super Christians that sometimes, like, they know so much. Yeah, they're not living out so much. They're so focused on knowing all the information, not putting it into practice, that all of a sudden they're like the worst people to ever be around. They're always trying to put you in, a, in your place because you don't, you don't know every little detail of every theological belief that you could ever hold to. And so this is what the Apostle Paul's saying. He's like, listen, set all that other stuff aside. He's writing, listen to me, he's writing to the church in Corinth. For those of you who don't know, that is a jacked up church. Like, listen, we're a jacked up church. Just like the time out from the message here, just to, to let you know in case you're just visiting us for the first time. This place is a messy, broken place. Every single one of us, your pastor included, 
messy, broken people who are stumbling along our way trying to figure out how to follow Jesus. So if, if you're here and this is your first time and, and that describes you as well, then you're in the right place. If you're here and you got all your life figured out and you don't have any areas of sin or any issues in your life, to, then th- you're, you're going to get frustrated with us real quick. Still want you here so that eventually you figure out you do have sin and then you can deal with it. But, but you're going to get real frustrated until you get to that place. So he's, he's writing to the church in Corinth. So here, here's, what, here's what we know about the church in Corinth. Like these people were so broken, so messed up. Like, like th- there are things in this, in this letter that I honestly, like with kids in the room, couldn't preach on. Like that's the kind of stuff he's addressing. And so this is, this is chapter 15. He's, he's 15 chapters in. And what would happen when they would get these letters is they would actually have the whole church sit down in a room and they would read the letter from beginning to end. And, and Paul, at, at 15 chapters in, he's like, listen, I know because this is Corinth, there's a good percentage of people who checked out a long time ago. Like you've already, like you, you're just, you're so messy. You, you, somebody's probably in a fist fight right now over this sermon right now. So, so he, he says, I've got to address this again with you. I know there's some people who probably, they're ready to like leave the room right now. So let me come back to the matters of first importance. Essentially what he's saying is, if you don't get anything else out of this, make sure you get this. So let me say the same thing to you. If, if, if you've never gotten anything else out of church, if you've never gotten anything else out of Christianity, make sure you get this. These are matters of first importance. And so there, there are three things that, that he talks about here that are matters of first importance when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to knowing Jesus. The first one is this. Christ died for our sins. Christ died for our sins. This is exactly what he says here. For what I received, I passed on to you as a first importance, verse three, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now I'm gonna come back to that part at the end. But what you need to know and what you need to understand for right now is that Christ died for our sins. This is so important for us to grasp that the sinless, perfect son of God was willing to enter into our world to live a perfect, sinless life here, love people, care for people, teach people, shepherd people, heal people, perform miracles for people, raise people back from the dead, show them what God looks like, and then go to the cross on their behalf for their sins. And this is an important issue for me to preach on right now because even in the church, there's, there's some, some people who want to make, make some shifts away from the idea that Jesus died for our sins. I actually saw a meme this week because that's where theology happens now, is on, on Facebook memes. And, and somebody said, Jesus, the idea that uh, Jesus died in order to satisfy God's wrath for our sins isn't true. They said the reason why Jesus died is because he spoke truth to power in the Roman Empire. Here's the problem with that. That actually contradicts everything that Jesus himself said. Jesus didn't speak truth to power. Jesus was truth and power. Nobody could take Jesus' life from him. He says so in John 10. He said, you can't take my life from me. I willingly give it up myself. Why? For your sins. And, And if you're uncomfortable with that, that's fine. We all should be a little bit uncomfortable with that. We should wrestle with that. We should have some humility when it comes to that. But ultimately, we need to understand the matters of first importance. Jesus died. Why? For your sins and for my sins. So here's, here's what we should understand from that then. Two things. Number one, how much God hates sin. Absolutely hates and despises sin and how big of a deal sin is to God. And then number two, how much God absolutely loves you and me. Both of those things held together, that God absolutely hates sin. He is a a holy, perfect, just God. He cannot associate with sin. He hates sin, and he must deal with sin. There must be consequences for sin. And it is a big deal to God. And simultaneously, how much God loves you. Listen, you are made in the image of God. Every single one of you made in the image of God. He made you in his image and in his likeness. He knit you together in your mother's womb. He knows you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made and he loves you. He loves you completely and wholly. He loves you. So so when you think about the value of something, The way that we determine the value of something 
is the price that somebody is willing to pay for it. The price that somebody's willing to pay for it. Not just the price that somebody sets for it, but also the price that somebody's willing to pay for it. For example, you may think the value of something that you own is incredible, and so you set a price that's really, really high. But if nobody's willing to pay that price, then guess what? It's not worth what you thought it was. Maybe it is to you, but to nobody else. On the other hand, if somebody is willing to actually pay the price that you set, then that will guarantee its value. So let me give you an example. How many of you are familiar that earlier in this calendar year, Tom Brady retired from football? Anybody? Anybody in here? You hear that kind of like, like general, like kind of dissatisfaction whenever you say Tom Brady's name? It's because we got a bunch of Colts fans in the room. And so they're like, "Uh, yeah, Tom Brady, great. Yeah, good thing he retired. Well, um, so Tom Brady retired this year. And then after he retired, the football that he threw his very last touchdown catch to, touchdown pass to, went up for auction. So, so he retired. This, this means this football was the last football that he, he was ever going to throw a touchdown with, went up for auction. Now, somebody could set the price for that auction at any dollar amount. They may think it's worth that, but unless somebody pays a certain price, it's no longer worth that. That football sold for $518,000. Dollars, And I can almost guarantee you, a man bought that football. <laughs> so, man, the next time you're giving your wife a hard time about spending some money on a leather purse, just think about 518000 Like, we all have our thing, okay? $518,000. And then I think it was two days later, Tom Brady unretired from the, <laughs> from the NFL. <laughs> that football was no longer worth $518,000. That guy could not turn around and sell that football for $518,000 even though he paid $518,000 for it. Now, I I heard that this week it actually all got settled out. The guy got his money back and, and the whole deal is off at this point. Here's my point. God set a price for your sin. And the price was perfect sacrifice. He said, that's how costly it is. He set a price for that sin, and he said, the price is perfect sacrifice. And then simultaneously, God said, this is how much you're worth. I'm going to pay the price myself. I'm going to give my own life for you. God said he's going to give his own son for you. That's how much you're worth to him. So yes, the cost of your sin is great, but it was worth it to him because you are worth it to him to pay that price so that you could be saved. Christ died for your sins. He died for for your sins. Number two, Christ was buried and raised on the third day. He was buried and raised on the third day. So back to to verse three. It says, I've passed on to you what is of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Verse four, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And then we'll come back to verse five here in a minute. Here's why this matters. Paul is giving us very specific detail. He's not just telling us that Jesus died for your sins and that later on Jesus rose from the grave. He's reporting about an event that happened. So so he's he's telling us, yes, he he died for your sins and he was buried. I can actually show you where he was buried. I can point, point you to the tomb. I can show you where it happened. And then on the third day, he was raised to life. We have evidence of this fact that this event actually took place. And listen, this is the crux of the passage for Paul. This is the crux of the gospel for Paul. Not just that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, but that he also was raised to new life on the third day, that he resurrected from the grave, conquering death, hell, and the grave. Listen, Christ dying for your sins is part of the gospel, but it's not the whole gospel. Paul actually says so. He he goes on to say later in this chapter that if Christ has not been raised, your faith is useless and you are still in your sin. So it's important for us to understand this. Like our faith is anchored to the resurrection of Jesus. Not just that he died. Listen, plenty of people have died for other people. Only one person has died for other people and then resurrected from the grave, and that's Jesus. That's what separates Christianity from any other faith or any other belief system in the world. 
He resurrected from the grave on the third day. The gospel does not end with Jesus dying for your sins. That, that would be a, a hopeless faith. And we should just go on with our lives doing whatever we want to do, living however we want to live. There is no purpose in putting our trust in Jesus. But if Jesus really did, go to the cross for your sins, like he said he would, and then resurrect from the grave on the third day, like he said he would, then it changes everything. And it changes everything for you and for me and for the whole world. And so it's so important that we understand this. Yes, Jesus died for our sins, but yes, he also was buried and raised on the third day. Later on in this passage, verse 20, same chapter, 15, verse 20, Paul says this, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now that statement may sound a little strange to you, but let me explain what he's saying here. Uh, He uses the language fallen asleep multiple times, and what he's referring to is people who've died or passed away. So we have that same thing. When, 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 we, when people die, we have other words to say it to kind of soften it up because it's a really harsh thing to come to grips with. So we say things like people have passed away. And so he uses the language of fallen asleep, meaning Christ has indeed been raised, the first fruits of those who have died, meaning Jesus is the first one to raise from the dead, but he will not be the last one to raise from the dead. Now listen to this, verse 21. For since death came through a man... The resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For in as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Meaning all of us because of Adam, because of the sin of humanity, because of the first man's sin, all of us, not just Adam, but all of us have experienced death. We, all of us in here have known somebody who has died. We've all experienced it. And ultimately that, that will happen for us as well. As in Adam all die, so in in Christ, all will live again. We will be made alive. This is why I say this all the time. There is more to life than this life. There is more to life than this life. Our hope is not just in this life. Yes, when we say yes to Jesus, we experience this new life and that begins in the here and now. We get to live in that already and not yet. We get to experience the beauty of the kingdom of God here on earth as it is in heaven. But there is a reality that this world is still broken, still fallen, and because of that, we will still experience suffering and pain and sadness and sorrow. And listen, I, I of all people in here can testify to this, not because of my own experiences, but because as your pastor, I know yours. This, this last year of life alone has been one of the hardest years for many, many people in this room. I mean, whatever you can imagine as far as suffering and tragedy and loss goes, it's taken place here, whether it's an unexpected diagnosis, whether it's the loss of a loved one, tragedy, betrayal, heartache, losing children, you name it. I mean, we, we've experienced it all in this church body. So so we know that this life, if all we have in this life is to hope for this life alone, then there's no hope at all. But if the story of Jesus is true, if he really died for your sins and then really resurrected from the grave, conquering death, hell, and the grave, then we have resurrection hope too. As we just sang, the resurrected king is resurrecting me. And that means that no matter what you face in this life, no matter what you experience in this life, no matter what tragedy or heartache or difficulty you experience in life, there is always hope that one day there will be a new heaven and a new earth and all things broken will be made whole and be made new and will be made right. And that is where we put our hope and our trust. Our faith hinges on this fact. It is of first importance that Jesus died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he resurrected on the third day, according to the scriptures, and then number three is this, that there were eyewitnesses to prove it. That, that's his case. That's his case for the gospel message. Yes, Jesus died for your sins. Yes, he rose on the third day. And yes, there were eyewitnesses to prove it. Go back to, and, and look at verse 5. And that he appeared, after he did, that, after, after he did that, that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. So yesterday, we set up almost 500 chairs in this room. We put a chair everywhere we could set a chair up in this room without causing trouble or problems for people to get through here. So imagine that. Jesus appearing to a group that more than this size, more than the amount of people that are in this room right now appearing to them at one time 
What Paul is essentially saying is, don't believe me, ask them. He goes on to say, most of whom are still living. Some have fallen asleep, some have died, but most of them are still living. Go find them. Go ask them. They're also proclaiming this same good news that they encountered the resurrected Jesus. They saw Jesus die on a cross. They saw him get buried in the tomb. And then on the third day, they saw him resurrect from the grave. There were eyewitnesses to prove it. So this is what separates Christianity from from any other religion. Our faith is, is not based off of a bunch of moral principles or beliefs. It's, it's not this religious system. Our faith is based off of the event of Jesus Christ dying on the cross and resurrecting from the grave and people living to tell about it and seeing it and wit- witnessing it. Your faith is in Jesus. It's in a resurrected Jesus. So, so let me just help you out a little bit more in case you're wrestling with this. When Paul wrote this letter, it was in the mid-50s AD, about 20 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. There was no earthly incentive for anybody to proclaim that Jesus was the resurrected king. It was actually the exact opposite. Christians at this point in history were being persecuted everywhere from all angles and all sides. The, the, the Jewish people were persecuting Christians because they, they thought that they were a, a cult, essentially, a, a fake group of, of fake followers, not really belonging to the true God. So they were persecuting Christians. And then the Roman Empire was persecuting Christians because they saw them as a threat to their empire. So it would be of no earthly benefit for you to claim that Jesus is truly the risen king. You would lose your family. You would be abandoned. You would lose your livelihood. Many times you would lose your home. And many people were being killed because of it. And it's at that point in human history that Paul says, if you don't believe me, there are people who are being persecuted all over the place and they won't deny it because they saw it. There's no reason for somebody to make that story up. But there is a reason for people to proclaim it even in the face of adversity and persecution if it really happened. And so what Paul says is that this is the gospel. This is the good news. In its simplest form, it's this, that Jesus died for your sins and my sins. That Jesus, on the third day, resurrected from the tomb, conquering death, hell, and the grave, and giving us that new life in him. And there are people who saw it for themselves, and they can tell you all about it. This is a true story, a real event that happened in real time. You cannot improve upon the gospel. You cannot make a better story than this one. It's the greatest story of all, and the greatest part about it is that it's true. Now, I said earlier on that I was going to come back to one part in this passage that he he makes the statement multiple times. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That Jesus was buried and raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So what, what Paul is doing here is he's helping us to understand Jesus didn't just do these things because he thought it was a good idea to do. What he's saying is, this was always God's plan. It's not like God got caught on his heels. Like, I, you know, I created these people, and then I gave them the law, and I was really hoping it was going to work out. I hope they would finally be obedient to me. And you know what? It, it didn't work out, so I'm sorry, Jesus. I guess I'm going to have to plan B. I'm going to send you. You're going to have to go die for these people. No, from the beginning, this was always God's plan. And I wish, I wish I had time to unpack Every single Old Testament passage that that teaches us this truth, that teaches us that the Bible from cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation is all about Jesus. I wish I had time to do that, but we'd be here for months. So I'm going to honor you today, and I'm just going to share one passage of Scripture, because here's the important part of this. When Paul says, according to the Scriptures, he's not talking about the New Testament. He's not talking about that yet. This letter, believe it or not, was actually written before the Gospels were written. Before Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written, now they had these stories and and they were still alive, so they were still telling these stories, still communicating this, but they didn't have the actual New Testament gospel letters of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He's not talking about that. What he's talking about is actually according to the Old Testament scriptures, according to what has been proclaimed, what God has professed from the beginning. And so I just want to share one passage with you. We're not going to put it on the screen because it's too long and I don't have all that kind of time for you today, and I know you don't have that kind of time for me today. And so here's what we're going to do. 
Isaiah chapter 52. I'm just going to quickly read through the end of 52 and 53. Now, a lot of times, if you're familiar with this passage, uh, if you've spent a lot of time at church, you, you probably recognize Isaiah 53. But it's actually important that we go back. This, this, this passage is about Jesus. And you're going to see that very clearly. But it starts at the end of Isaiah 52. It's a passage about the, the suffering servant. And so I just, I just want to re read this to you and, and hopefully help for some of you maybe open your eyes for the first time to the fact that this has been God's plan all, all along. Always been his plan. This was written 700 years before Jesus walked the earth. 700 years. And this is what it says. I'm going to start at Isaiah 52, verse 13. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted resurrection. Verse 14, there, just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond any human likeness, crucifixion. Verse 15, so he will sprinkle many nations. That's a reference to the promise that God gave Abraham that all nations would be blessed through his offspring. Jesus being a descendant of Abraham and his blood sprinkled to bless every nation, every tongue, every tribe. And, and think about this. There are literally billions of Christians today all over the globe living this out. Living out this exact passage. The second part of verse 15. And kings will shut their mouths because of him, for what they were not told they will see, and what they have not heard they will understand. I don't know if you've noticed, but the Roman Empire doesn't exist anymore. But the Church of Jesus Christ does. The Church of Jesus Christ does. And it's bigger than any empire that's ever existed on this planet. Chapter 53, verse 1. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom the people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. Listen to this, the detail, verse 5. 700 years before Jesus was crucified, this was written. But he was pierced for our transgressions. Every nail through his hand and feet pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. That's another word for sin. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. Jesus died for our sins. And by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned our own way. I don't know about you, but I know that's my story. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. All of our sin was placed upon the shoulders of Jesus. Verse 7, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Remember when he stood trial and he did not defend himself. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Listen to this. Yet who of this generation protested? Remember? When the crowd had an opportunity to protest his death? Remember on Palm Sunday, they were saying Hosanna, waving palm branches and praising him. And then just, just one week later, they're yelling, crucify him. And they have an opportunity in this moment to protest his death. And instead, they chose Barabbas. They said, release Barabbas and crucify Jesus. And remember when Pilate said... I washed my hands of this, and the response from the crowd was, his blood will, pee, will be upon our hands. Who from this generation has protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked. He will be buried. And on the third day, he was raised to life. And with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. He was sinless. Yet it was the Lord's will, verse 10, 
Listen to this for anybody who wants to argue that this wasn't God's plan, that Jesus didn't have to die for your sins. Listen to this. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, Jesus died for your sin. It was a sacrifice, an offering for your sin that you could not pay. He will see his offspring and prolong his days, resurrection. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. On the third day, he will raise again. By his knowledge of my righteous servant will justify many and will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. Remember, he wasn't the only one hanging on a cross. There were others there with him. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. This was always God's plan. According to the scriptures, it was always God's plan to send his son to die in your place on the cross for your sin, to be buried and to raise on the third day, conquering death, hell, and the grave and to offer you new resurrection life in him. This was always God's plan. And so here's how we're gonna finish our time today. I'm gonna to ask you, uh, if everybody here would, if you would just simply bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want you to take a moment here and just ponder whether or not you have actually made that decision yourself to, to put your hope and your faith and your trust in Jesus. To believe in the good news of the gospel to believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and that he rose from the grave for your new life. And, and, and I'm, I'm just convinced that there are people in this room who you, you are here by divine providence today. God brought you here. You're not here by accident. And now is the time. Today is the day. This is the moment for you to make that decision, to surrender your life to Christ, to receive his free gift of salvation and to cross from death into life to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for your sins, and that he rose from the grave for you. And so if there's anybody here in this room, here's what we're gonna do in just a moment. I'm gonna ask you, if that's you and you wanna make that decision, just simply to raise your hand. We're not gonna ask you to come forward. We're not gonna ask you to do anything else. Just simply raise your hand so that God can see your commitment to him that you're gonna place your faith and trust in him. And then from there, we're all going to pray a prayer together. I'm gonna have you repeat after me and we're all gonna pray a prayer together of surrender to Jesus. But I just wanna encourage you not to let this moment pass you by. And so if that's you and you would say that today is the day and now is the time that you wanna make a commitment to give your life to Jesus and to trust him that his, his death on the cross was good enough for you to pay the price for your sins and that his resurrection was good enough to give you new life, simply raise your hand at this time. See hands in every section of the room and all over the room. I want to give you another second here. Just simply raise your hand. We're not going to ask you to do anything else. Just raise your hand. Make that decision to give your life to Christ. Amen. Amen. You can lower your hands back down. And before we pray, I just want to speak to those of you who just raised your hand. I want to encourage you. Not only did I see your hand, but God saw your hand. He saw the, the, the step of faith that you just took. He saw you choose to surrender your life to him, to trust him with your life and to believe in his death and his res resurrection for your salvation. And I, I just wanna encourage you, he's gonna honor that. He's gonna honor that in you, in you and in, in your life. So at this time, if everybody would, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask you just to repeat this prayer after me. Jesus, I need you. I give my life to you. And I receive your life. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins that you rose from the grave for my salvation. I put all of my hope and faith in you. I receive your Holy Spirit. And I choose to follow you all the days of my life. And it's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. 
Well, hey, church, let's celebrate our brothers and sisters who just gave their lives to Christ. Come on, come on, come on.